on. Because it's kind of sad when we think of the fact that so many that do come back for more these days, 22 veterans a day commit suicide in America. Are you aware of that? 22 veterans every day commit suicide in America. That's really a whole holdover from the post-traumatic stress syndrome that they go through when they're over at war. This morning I want to talk about kind of a heavy topic, but a topic that needs to be addressed in the church. And I'll be honest with you, in about 28 years of pastoring, I've never preached on this before. But this week God spoke to my heart and just very clearly impressed upon me to speak on this topic this morning, and that's suicide. Never done before? Don't always know if I want to do it again. And then we got to worship service this morning, and, and um, part of worship today could have just brought out, actually, just almost the scriptures that I have in my notes this morning. Because suicide is becoming a real, growing issue in our society. Suicide between 1999 and 2014 has increased 24% in America. That's not even taking into the statistics what's happening over the last couple of years. In the last couple of years, and in 2016, they reported that suicide amongst children from the ages of 5 to the ages of 17 has dr- drastically increased to the point that 118,000 children attempt suicide every year. That's just <coughs> not acceptable. In addition to that, 159,000 kids are admitted to hospitals with self-inflicted wounds. There's a problem. If you think that suicide then is just re- relegated to our young people and our soldiers, the fastest growing rate, 64% increase of suicide exists between women between the ages of 45 and 64. It's a growing epidemic in our society. And there's something called suicide contagion that when one hears about or finds out someone who does talk about suicide, that the very concept of hearing about it or talking about it in some will actually drive them to commit it. Hopefully not in this setting. Netflix has come out with a series, 13 Reasons Why. I have not personally watched it, but I've heard so much about it. And since that, the rise of teen suicide has been on the rise just because of the awareness. It's almost glamorized. And although I think it was originally given to not glamorize, but to explain why it's happening and the problems with bullying in our schools, I think it's almost had a reverse effect in our schools. And we've seen the effect of suicide in Fort Lupton. We've seen it in the surrounding communities. We're hearing about it all over the place. And we need to look at this very real problem and ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about it? Do you know that Denver ranks fourth in our nation, the fourth city with the highest rates of suicide, the Denver metro area? We are one of the fastest growing states. We are the fastest growing metro area in the United States. We are actually dubbed as one of the happiest or most happy places in America to live. And yet we have the fourth highest suicide rate in our region. So I want to take a look at this topic. You say, Pastor, man, it's Memorial Day weekend. We just want to go out and relax. Yeah, I know. But let's look at this topic for a minute this morning. There are seven examples in Scripture of suicide. Six of them are linked to war. They're linked to honor and battle, quote, unquote, or war situations. I'm not going to discuss those. That's a whole topic for a different day, if that's right or not. But there's one in Scripture that's actually linked to despair and emotionally being distraught. And that's when when Judas went out and hung himself because of the guilt and the shame that he experienced. His lack of being able to forgive himself after he had betrayed Jesus. He had come to such great anguish. And the Bible says it becomes so tormented. Because I don't believe anyone can go through the process of suicide without having a spiritual effect tormenting their soul. I don't believe that every person who's depressed has necessarily come to that place, but the enemy doesn't want us to have life. The enemy wants to destroy us. And we need to understand, what does God's word say? So let's get into it. First thing I want to talk about is a biblical perspective on suicide. It starts here with one very simple thought, respecting life. Can you say that? Respecting life. Exodus 20.13 says this. You must not murder. 
Can you say that? You must not murder. It doesn't say you must not murder others. It says you must not murder. In other words, you must not take the life of another human. That's murder. Murder is strictly relegated to human beings. We see that the first sin recorded in God's word after the fall in the the Garden of Eden, the first sin we see is when that's recorded is when Cain kills his brother Abel and murders him. Murder is very, life is very important to God. How we treat life is very important to Him. In fact, God chose to destroy the world by flood because man had become so wicked. And what was the wickedness that the Bible recognized? It was the fact that people were killing one another. The greatest part of God's creative process is that He created and gave life. Your life matters to God. You matter to God. The fact that you're living, some say, well, if the quality of life isn't there. Mm -mm. Every life has quality. Every life has meaning. Every life has has purpose. Life is a gift given to each of us. And Jesus came to restore our eternal life. And God desires for us to respect the life that we have been given. As well as the life that he has given to others. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 7, 17, the second half of the verse, it says, don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Because you see, how we live, our living matters to God. The past or the pain, the suffering that some people go through. Life is ours to live until that day that God has appointed for us to be taken home. You hear me this morning? God values life. You know who doesn't value life? The devil. Now I know that there are a great amount of Christians who don't believe the devil's a real thing, but I'm pretty convinced that he is. And the Bible tells us that the devil has come to steal and rob us of life. John 10 10 says the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus wants our life to be abundant. He wants our life to be full. He wants our life to have what this word is behind me. Hope. He wants us to know that purpose. And Jesus is all about restoring purpose and hope in our life. But the devil is all about wanting to bring destruction into our lives. And he's wanting to bring death to us. Because if he can get us to die, if he can kill us off without having hope in Christ, then he knows he can claim our souls. So, what does he do to do that? He lies to us. The devil lies to us. He gets us to despise the gift that we have been given of life. He deceives us to begin to make us think that we have no purpose. He gets into our head and tries to confuse us and make us think that we have no value. We have no purpose. The pain will never go away. The things that we've endured are going to haunt us for the rest of our life. That we are not forgiven. Whatever it might take to get us to despair. He keeps us from coming to church so we can't praise God. Because he knows that when we begin to praise God, that heaviness has to flee. Amen. That's a promise in the word. The other thing he gets us to do, and it's a real problem, is the devil tries to lie to us by getting us to harbor our hurts. Taking notes, write this down. Depression is unresolved anger. Depression is unresolved anger. You see, the lie that he gets to work into our lives is to get us to feel unforgiveness towards other people. Anybody ever been hurt by somebody else? Come on. We've all been hurt. Do not raise your hands and don't believe. We've all been hurt by someone. Some of us have learned what it is to forgive and to forgive quickly. Some of us, sometimes some hurts go so deep that it takes a long time to forgive. It's a process that we have to walk through. But often what's going on in the suicidal person's mind is they've been hurt somehow. They've been bullied. They've been mistreated. They've been wounded. They've been betrayed. 
They might be lonely because someone left them or a friend left them or a spouse left them. They might be hurting because of the way they're treated at school. Anyhow you look at that, the majority of people who are at that place have been hurt or wounded in some way or form. And as that hurt is there underneath the surface, it begins to fester. And that unforgiveness begins to settle in. And if unforgiveness settles in, it creates anger. And Jesus tells us that anger is literally the same thing as murder. Anger that we hold on to. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. This is Jesus. These are his words. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. <laughs> Let me take a little side trip right there. If you curse someone, cursing has risen drastically in our society to the point that the 80 to 80 to 90 times a day, our youth are using the cuss word. They didn't get it without hearing it from someone. They didn't get it, they didn't hear it flooding their minds through media or in their own home. But we've been training them that it's okay to begin cursing other people and cussing out other people. And we've trained them so much to not value the life of another person. Because that's really what a curse is. More than a foul word. Cursing is basically wishing harm or, or, or proclaiming pain to somebody else. So even though sometimes we've, we've defaulted to every other word being a cuss word, what we're doing is we're trying to create pain on somebody else. Christians, let me tell you something. If cussing is a part of your life, take a look. Because we need to be cleaning that up. We don't want to be passing that on to our children. Because what we're doing is we're teaching our children that life is cheap. To feed the anger that we might have inside And as that anger begins to dwell, as we allow for unforgiveness, it brings anyone who won't forgive into places of despair. Places where they begin to lash out. Places where they begin to try and hurt others. Because the ultimate thing in many suicides is, I'll show them. Are you following me? I'll show them. The problem is, all the glamour that's around that, the pain that somebody else will experience... In all reality, when we say, I'll show them, you're not going to be around to enjoy them feeling the pain that you want to inflict upon them. (coughs) Hopelessness comes out of unforgiveness. It comes out of feeling indebted. It comes out of a sense of shame, a sense of guilt, and it also is spun by wanting to take control of something we feel that we cannot control. Depression also comes from those things which we cannot control control in our life now the opposite of that if you really want to stop and think of it and this is why this is what the bible says and you say well how does it have to deal with suicide well if a person is in Christ they're a new creation if how do we get saved by what are we saved I know grace is one but what's the other thing that, that causes us to be saved Mercy. Faith. faith the just shall live by faith what does faith mean it means to trust something, to trust in God. Faith is trusting in God, that God is our sufficiency, that God's word is enough, that God is even God over our circumstances or over our sins. When we can't trust God with our lives and the things that are even causing us pain, that's when we become to break relationship with God. Suicide comes to a place where we say that God isn't able to change my circumstance. God isn't able to change my pain. God isn't able to do something different in my life. And it really comes to a place of hopelessness because of lack of faith. Let's talk about something else this morning. Undeniable hope. Undeniable hope. When we lose hope, we lose everything. My father-in-law used to have a saying, it's been said before, and it's not found in the Bible, but it's biblically based. Where there's life, there's hope. Suicide is the ending of the potential of hope. We must be in a place, if we 
follow Christ, and I speak to you as Christians, if we know Christ, there's always hope. And those who don't know Christ, there is hope. It's found in Jesus. If they choose to reject Jesus, they're rejecting the hope, but it doesn't mean that the hope is not there. We cannot deny hope just because we don't feel it. We cannot deny hope just because we try to put up an obstacle or a wall from it. And many people, even people, we go, well, what about this Christian who took to their life? Or what about this Christian who did this? At some place, that Christian began to have a broken relationship with God because they lost faith and they lost hope. Because hope is undeniable. Losing hope is the furthest place we can become from God. And again, that's buying in to the lies of Satan. John 8, Jesus again speaking. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. Suicide is murder. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. And that's the confusion that the enemy wants to bring into the person's mind who is contemplating taking their own life. He brings that confusion, he brings in the lies, and he brings in the destruction because his goal is to destroy us. While Jesus' goal is to help us to overcome the world. Christ wants us to overcome. He wants to give us life and life more abundantly. Jesus wants to take us to the other side of our pain. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? Because on this side of pain, there's another side. When pain is some wall, some obstacle in life, Christ, and we might be going through a trial, a circumstance, we might be without a job, we might be financially suffering, we might be going through physical sickness, there still is always an other side. And Christ wants to be our strength and our help. We sang it this morning, a mighty fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is His name. He's the place to turn to for strength. There's always hope. In Cornerstone we were singing about, about the hope of Christ. There's another side that God always wants to bring us over to. There were people in the Bible, you know, if you look at the Bible and the characters of the Bible, I'm only going to mention three this morning, but there was character after character after character in the Bible who were distraught. They went through pain, they went through trial, they went through difficulty. Even some to the point of saying that they despised their life or wished they would die. Elijah. Elijah, a mighty prophet of God. Elijah, who actually called down fire from heaven to consume an altar and, and, and conquered over and, and proved the queen and king of his nation to be wrong. Then was fleeing for his life as she was trying to kill him. And in a place of exhaustion, sits down saying, tired of the battle, tired of the fight in life, tired of life's struggles, said these words from 1 Kings 19.4, 19, sorry. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. This mighty warrior of God who had just conquered an amazing battle through the supernatural power of God's spirit upon him was now finding himself in a place of emptiness and exhaustion, tired of life, wishing he would die. Solomon wrote that he hated life because he found that it had a lack of purpose. Ecclesiastes 2.17 says, So I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. You know, if we think that we can end our lives because our life has no purpose then we need to find our purpose in Jesus Christ. We're looking for our purpose in what this world has to offer and not in what Jesus has to offer. Even Solomon, a man who had everything. We talked about him a a, a month or so ago. Remember we talked about his wisdom? But we talked about this guy. He had everything. He had wives. He had wealth. He had houses. He had palaces. He owned a country. He had wisdom. He had the, 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 the power of other world rulers around him. And yet he said, I've come to hate life. It's meaningless. Jonah. Jonah had just gone through an experience. Man, he had been swallowed by a great fish. He had been vomited up on the sea. He went and preached a word to an entire city. 
of 100,000 people. And they all got saved. Woohoo! And then he goes out and he's mad because he doesn't like, he's, he's, he's prejudiced against the culture. And in his anger, because he didn't get his control, he didn't get his way, and he became angry. He says, and as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. He said, death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. There are places that we can be in our life that we think the pressure is too much, the anguish is too much, the suffering is too much. We're not alone. There are plenty of people in the Bible who felt the same way. But they persevered. They didn't take their lives. And they experienced, each of them, what it is to come to the other side. Because there's always hope. The other side exists. Hope abounds in Jesus' name. And if we're feeling that, that hopelessness, that despair, that pit, we need to come back and we need to get our eyes on Him. As little as that song said it this morning. We need to get our eyes on Him. We need to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Psalm 43, 5 says, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So if we're feeling hopeless, we've got to get our focus back, get our eyes set back on Jesus because He is our hope. Psalm 119, 114. We sang this again this morning. You are my refuge and my shield. Your word is my source of hope. When all else in life seems to be failing us, when it seems that God is not keeping His promises, when it seems that... that, that It's just going to be destruction. It's just going to be turmoil. We need to get our eyes fixed back on Jesus and realize there is an other side. And that hope is only found in Christ. The enemy will lie and tell you, nope, there's no more hope. Nope, the situation cannot change. Nope, it's always going to be like this. And as long as we listen to what the devil says, we're going to stay in that place of hopelessness. As long as we reject hearing the truth of what God says. You know, sometimes our will wants to do our own thing. So we don't want to turn to God. We don't want to trust in God. We don't want to trust God's plan and believe in God. So we would rather stay in that place of hopelessness and despair than receive the hope that we can find in Jesus. Don't give in to the lies of the devil. Hebrews 10.23 says... Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. There's one other thing that comes up very strongly in every person's mind when they hear of someone who's taken their life. Does that person go to hell? Does that person go to heaven? Well, I, I want to I let you know, when people die, they're going to one place, heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. You're going to either heaven or you're going to hell. If the last act of your life is taking your life, you are stacking the odds in the wrong direction. I'm not saying that's where you end up, but I'm just saying you're stacking your odds in the wrong direction. Who cannot get into heaven? What? Murderers, yeah. If you're not saved, you can't go to heaven, can you? So right there we have one position. When we look at the six other suicides in God's word, we look at all their lives and none of them, there was wickedness in all their lives, none of them were serving God, even though they were Old Testament. We see the pattern of backsliding that Saul fell into. Though he had been God's chosen person, he would rather consort with mediums. He would rather disrespect being obedient to God and do his own thing. And we see that backslid in place. If you're not saved, you're not going to heaven. You can convince yourself all you want that you are, but you're not. Jesus says, I am the way, the life, and the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. If we have not yielded our lives to Christ in repentance of sin, it's not happening. But what about that Christian? 
That person who used to go to church, that person who had found God, that person who had been serving God. Well, I do want to let you know that in Scripture, in Scripture, not once in any of these positions of suicide does God mention whether they go to heaven or hell. And there's probably a very real reason for this. Because only God knows. If God endorsed that a person committing suicide go to heaven, there would be a lot more people winding down the pain of life. And if God said that a person committing suicide goes to hell, then it's probably a pain that the family, because the family becomes the true victim, it's probably more grief than that family can bear. So God's word is not actually clear on that. However, God's word is clear on a few things. And the thing that we have to go to, William, would you go to the next slide, please? The thing that we have to realize is we must trust judgment to God. We must trust judgment to God. If a person has come to such a great place of hopelessness, there, that is a sign that there's been broken relationship between them and God. Because when we come to a place where we cannot find hope in Jesus Christ, then that means we're not in relationship with him. You know that salvation is not just saying a sinner's prayer, right? Y'all hear me, hear me this morning? Salvation is not just saying a sinner's prayer. Salvation is entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we break that relationship with Jesus Christ, we can begin to feel hopelessness and despair. We also know that murder is a sin. As Christians, we also understand that 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us that we are to respect these bodies that God has given us. These are the temples of the Holy Spirit. But we're not God. We don't know. You know, someone says, well, God surely can't send someone to a place of mental anguish to hell. Nobody comes to the place of mental anguish without walking away from some of the things that God wants them to do in their life. However, sometimes I know, I know that there are people sometimes that they, they, they've been on a prescription drug that led them to suicide. I'll, I'll tell you right now, I had a doctor prescribe a cholesterol drug for me. I didn't have a cholesterol problem, but he decided to prescribe a cholesterol drug for me. And I took that drug, and after I took, I was on that, I was on that, that pill for, for about two, three weeks, and I didn't understand what was going on. I'm like, I didn't want to wake up in the morning. I started contemplating what the purpose of life was. I started, I started really telling myself, I don't want to live. I was taking a cholesterol drug. It wasn't like something else, something psychotic or some illegal drug. But I was literally getting to the point, I was scaring myself. And I said something to my wife, and we did some research, and we found out that a lot of people taking this drug have committed suicide. But will God hold that person responsible? You know what? Only God knows that. If a person's already now serving Jesus, it doesn't make a difference. But for the Christian who served Christ, I would hope that somehow in our lives we would speak out, we would call out, we would turn to the Lord, and I know that God would give wisdom. I believe God gave me wisdom in that scenario. I got to a point I just couldn't stand I, it, just, it, was, it was tormenting me so much. Two days off of that pill, happiness was back. Felt like a normal person again. Felt normal. We have to come to a place, though. Someone might also ask the question, well, they could always repent of sin. And that is true. We don't know what happens in those moments that someone might be in a place that maybe we cannot communicate with them, but their spirit can communicate with God. So no one really knows what's going on in the heart of a person. Only God does. God is the only one who can truly discern. And we have to believe that he is a just judge who knows the heart. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10 says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength. If you're trusting in your own strength, is that human strength? Yeah, our strength is human strength. It's trusting trust in God's strength. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an inhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. 
Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. I say that because we can speculate, but we never know the heart in final moments. And that's when we have to trust judgment to God. But that says God will give us due reward. I do believe there's warning in Scripture in this. If your last action of life is a sin that God despises, you're not putting yourself in a great position for heaven, are you? Only God actually knows the heart that is truly his as well. Psalm 7, verses 8 to 11 says, The Lord judges the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I am innocent, O Most High. And the evil of those who are wicked and defend the righteous. For you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. Man, I can rest in that concept right there. If you wonder, all the speculation that comes in around this topic, leave it right there. God is an honest judge. God is an honest judge. I don't believe that that means that God, through His grace, lets everyone who takes their life go to heaven. But I believe that God can judge truly your heart, truly the circumstances that maybe we are unaware of. There's no justification for suicide. But God is an honest judge, and we can trust him. Psalm 96, 10 to 13 says, Tell all the nations the Lord reigns. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He will judge all peoples fairly. Let the earth, let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with his truth. He will use truth in his judgment. You see, you and I, were tainted. I know we have some good judges out there and we have some bad judges out there. Because judges are tainted by their humanity and their imperfection. But God is perfect. And his judgment is right. Psalm 135, 14 says, For the Lord will give justice to his people and have compassion on his servants. Last, I want to read to you from Revelation 20, verses 12 to 13. It says, I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. There's a reason why God tells us to not judge others. There's a reason why God says, judge not lest you be judged. In fact, God says, instead of judging other people, look at the problem in your own eye. Don't look at the speck in somebody else's eye, look at the big plank hanging out of yours, is what Jesus taught us. And there's a reason, because the only life that we can truly have effect on is our own and choosing to put our hope in the Lord and choosing to allow God to change and change our lives to make our lives right and to walk rightly before Him. So when it comes to those who've died in this manner, you don't absolutely know everything, so don't judge on it. Yes, the odds are stacked up not in a good place. And I will tell you as a pastor, if we are to base it upon what God's Word says, there's probably a greater chance that most people taking their lives will not be in heaven, as hard as that might be to sound. But I also know that only God knows the heart. So now that I've said all that, and you're totally depressed and ready to go on your Memorial Day weekend, <laughs> it's never a happy topic. I want you to understand what God's Word says about it, but what I want you to leave with is this. If you're in that place where you're ever even questioning, is life worth it? If you're in such a place of pain where you're ever even wondering if you'll ever come through it, I want you to remember these words that we said this morning. Where there's life, there's hope. And hope will always take us to the other side of the pain. Are you hearing? Yes, sir. Jesus didn't come to destroy life. He came to give life. And there's always hope in Christ. But I'm a Christian. I pray. I try. Okay. What's blocking that pain? 
What's blocking that sense of feeling that relief? Is there unforgiveness in our hearts? Because unforgiveness deals with unresolved anger. And anger leads to depression. Inability to control a situation leads to depression. So are we trusting God or are we trusting ourselves in that situation? Are we asking God to help us to forgive others? You know, Jesus said to forgive our debts as, as he forgives our debtors. I'm going to confuse that one. I'm preaching too long already. I've got to shut up and go on this morning. But the whole purpose behind that is just Jesus says, there's one thing that will block you from feeling the forgiveness of God. It does not mean that this forgiveness is not there, but will block you from experiencing the sense that God has forgiven you. And that's when you won't forgive another. You hear me? If you're ever in that place, don't be silent. It doesn't matter. You might feel that life is not having purpose. You might feel angry at something in life. Find help. Find it through a Christian brother or counselor or pastor. Because the world can give you advice, but only God can give you hope. And there is hope. And realize this. That hope is going to rely on your surrendering all to Jesus. It, re- it all depends on us giving him everything and trusting him. But if we would do that, that hope will come back flooding into our lives. I also want us to leave with this thought. If you have a loved one or someone close to you that has committed suicide, I want you to realize that that act that they committed is not your fault. People feel shame and guilt over what could I have done differently? What could I have said differently? Ultimately, a choice that one individual makes is their responsibility. Just like the choice of choosing Jesus, y'all realize, kids, you can't get to heaven on your parents' faith. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. Y'all catching that? You can't get to heaven on your parents' faith. You have to personally walk in your own faith with Christ. It's your choice. And we are each responsible for our own choices. So do not let guilt overwhelm you. And if you question because you're tormented that a loved one might have gone to hell, you need to realize that God is the honest judge. And you need to leave that in his hands and trust him to do what is right. Make sense? Would you bow your head with me? This was really a plot to keep you on long, longer on Memorial Day weekend.